nothing to tell has happened but for the fact that Mjöberg today went with a net to catch insects. Mjöberg created a lot of tension by his behavior actually. It's quite clear from the journals, especially the journals by Videl and Söderberg that he was not a likable person. That partly is what you can expect from an expedition. It's seldom you get it documented so well as in this one. Mjöberg told me the other day that he now has written 14 travel narratives on the journey. But he earns money from it, and that is for him the main point. Rather strange for an expedition to see that some of the members are totally unoccupied due to the fact that Mjöberg has not the guts to tell them to do something. Their foremost occupation is to sleep. Their enthusiasm was running out. Everywhere they went, the landscape was the same and what they found was the same. They were now simply hot, bored and hungry. They grew impatient, waiting for leadership from Muirberg to guide them through the most risky and contentious phase of the expedition. No one respects him. Muirberg is just still waiting for the mail and writing travel narratives. What is that to write about? The glowing disk of the sun slowly sinks. One can almost hear it sizzle as it submerges itself in the salt-filled sea. It is a moment of pure beauty. I was taken by two Aboriginal women to a site in the vicinity of Grace's Knob, central Kimberley, where the bodies of a young man and his wife were buried. I was told that the couple had been killed some months earlier because they had been involved in a wrong way marriage. Both bodies were exhumed and collected. One of the adults get old and old and die, just tie them up with paper bark. Then they put them in a tree somewhere to hide them so they can all mold away, put a ceremony smoke on them, and then they put them in a cave. As a tribe in that one place, they go back to the tribal place. It just carries on and on. You know, grandchildren and all that grace up, and they know where they're from, you know. They bury the dead ones in trees and they leave them there until the bones fall on the ground. And from the way the bones fall, they can tell how that person died. Then they wrap the bones in paper bark and put them into capes. In the vicinity of Grace's Knob, I exchanged a clay pipe for the bark bundled remains of an infant. They started collecting natural specimens and then they started taking Aboriginal remains. They, they stole the remains out of burial grounds, they desecrated the, the burial grounds, they bribed people, they bribed uh, station owners and, and Aboriginal stockmen to show them where the remains were. Early in the morning of New Year's Day, 1911, we had a daylight breakfast and saddled our horses. The rumour was out that a black was buried in a tree about 25 miles up the river with the promising name of Skeleton Hill. 
small ash heaps still smoking, and at places a broken boomerang told us that the still more or less wild river blacks were in the neighborhood. This fact, during a trip like this, was not to our advantage. There he is, in a tree about 50 meters in front of us, a dark, elongated object could be seen. At the top, there was the whitening skeleton of an Australian black. The skeleton was unusually intact. Every bone seemed to be there. The teeth, shining like pearls. Only at the top of the head, there was some skin left, covered by a tuft of black tangled hair. The smell was all but pleasant. I pulled out my knife and separated the bones from each other. The operation was quickly finished. We started from Brooklyn Gorge, right up to Oscar Homestead, along this range, right down to White Spring. You can see that tunnel now. He haven't got any phone left there. Used to be a lot of phone, you know. That's so we were searching around with them. We didn't see nothing. All gone. There was one member that was specialized in ethnographical artifacts, that was Laurel. He was also supposed to collect skeletons. Mjöberg uh, could uh, collect skeletons from his biological point of view. So they kind of overlapped there, but Mjöberg uh, were more obsessed in <laughs> collecting skeletons compared to Laurel. Laurel did it more like a duty, actually. A visit to another cave brought me still more skulls. One of them showed damage, attesting to the violent usage of a war club. On the western side of the hill, there were two large caves with spacious entrances. Inside, I found some children's skeletons. This little cave there, I might be put the people in there to be long time and that's where that the bloke come along and there's another cave here and they put the body in there long time ago. Eric had a rather strong personality and I think he somehow thrived on conflicts that made him alive. He had really big problems co with the cooperation and um, pissed off basically everyone. Mjöberg was the boss of course of the expedition, but he acted out that role in a very arrogant way. Mjöberg didn't arrange much himself really, so to create a nice situation. I can mention for example that at Christmas uh, everyone expected that he had arranged something uh, special for Christmas Eve and uh, they got nothing. <laughs> it's very clear that Almost everyone had a quarrel with Mjöberg, so they uh, were very happy when they could go on their own, and do their own work. Laurel and Söderberg, they went together to Sunday Island, and he used this opportunity to record music, songs, and also languages that are lost today.
it was also part of his role as ethnographer to collect music. Not many did that at the time. Det skedde med tillhjälp av en enkel fonograf. Vaxrullarna är öntåliga. Och man kunde inte vänta att resultatet skulle bli något vidare. Today we have discussed with Mjöberg whether we shall accompany his expedition or if we are going to start on our own. He became absolutely terrified when he heard that we might leave him. Vidal and Rosborg now both felt obligated to see the expedition through to the end. So they moved camp with Muirberg to Mount Anderson, then the biggest cattle station in the Kimberley, to collect more skeletons. It is now the Aboriginal community of Jalamadanga. <laughs> Arriving at the crest, I did not have to take many steps before I saw whitened human bones. I started to roll the heavy stones from the opening and now got a better view inside the cave. I crept into the narrow passage and was met by a suffocating, unpleasant smell. I groped with my hands in front of me as far as I could reach. I managed to take out two beautiful skulls. No white man, until now, had disturbed the peace of these natural burial vaults, and I tried my best to sweep away all traces of my actions. Well, I don't know how this Swedish fellow got it here. Uh, Merburn, whatever his name is, and um, at that time, people didn't know to say, no, you can't do that. Our people had hardship of colonization, um, and it was hard for them to stand up against a, a Gadia person, a white person, who telling them that you're doing the wrong thing. And a lot of Gadias got away with, um, with bad things happening to our people. Um, getting shot, getting poisoned, um, because Aboriginal people had no, no rights and w was treated really badly. I was at my camp labeling some animals when Dingo, the black chief, appeared and with a trembling voice told me that his brother Sambo was severely ill. I arranged for one of my men to keep.